so the topic of today's lecture is what's called digital watermarking. And so these days, um, you know, back when I was in college, right, there was this, uh, everyone was buying CDs, and then even then that was digital, right, but uh, the idea of ripping CDs and sharing them with your friends and so on didn't really come into play until maybe the late 90s, and suddenly all of the content manufacturers realized that they needed a way to either lock down or keep track of their digital content, and so that led to this explosion of interest in a, in a field of study called watermarking, okay? And so, um, there are a little bit, you know, there's some related terms, and so uh, one is called um, cryptography, right? So certainly you guys are familiar with that. Cryptography is basically the idea that I've got some sort of a, um, you know, clear information, by which I mean, you know, unencrypted, uncorrupted information that I put into some sort of a, you know, encryption framework that requires a key to undo. And then what comes out is basically, you know, some sort of useless information that can only be undone if I have the key, right? So, um, you know, inherently I can't undo this unless I have the key. And then what comes back is my original info. So the idea here is that there is no security at all on the original information, right? So once I put into this, you know, encryption thing, I get this, you know, string of what looks like pseudo-random bits. And then once the attacker undoes that encryption, then that information is free for everybody, right? And so um, a good example of that is DVDs, right? So when the DVD format just first came out, um, they were encrypted, and the only thing you could do is read them with your DVD player. And then some people who said, oh, I want to read my DVDs on my Linux machine, figured out how to undo the DVD encryption. They figured out the secret key that was inside the DVD player. And so that was a program called DECSS, right? That was the first DVD unencryption piece of software. And then once the DVDs were unencrypted, anyone could see the unencrypted bitstream, and that led to be able to, for example, put DVDs out on the torrents, right? Meaning that you know now the information is out there, and people could just zip it up and put it anywhere they wanted, right? So of course the content industry had a big problem with DVD on encryption, but now the horse is out of the gate because DVD is a standard, right? Which means that um, you know you can't change the way you make DVDs without totally redoing the standard. And so you know Blu-ray, for example, is a different standard, different media than DVDs, where they've attempted to do more. And people do try to get around things on DVDs by kind of, you know, um, sneaking around trying to make a whole bunch of like dummy tracks on DVDs and hiding them. But fundamentally, you know, once you've decrypted the DVD, in theory, the information is there for you to see. So we're not going to talk about cryptography here. We have a course on cryptography at RPI, right? Uh, or multiple courses. Then there's something called steganography, which is kind of like, you know, embedding a secret message into an innocent kind of a cover object. Um, and so the idea here is that in steganography, you are kind of trying to hide the fact that any communication is occurring at all, right? So this is more like Cold War spy stuff, right? Where the spies would put little micro dots of film inside a period and they would write a letter and stick it on the period and they'd mail it to their friend. And the idea was that you would never know that communication was occurring, right? So here, you're trying to kind of obscure the fact that there's a message at all, right? Um, so watermarking is kind of uh, in between those two things, right? So, so watermarking. is kind of in between. So the idea is to embed information into an image. And so here I'm going to mostly use images, although you can also use it with anything, especially with things like audio signals, so that, number one, the image 
seems unchanged, so no perceptual difference, but two is the watermark can be extracted even after processing, by which I mean you know, image resizing or image compression. So it is that this watermark should be very difficult to remove. And kind of ideally, um, you know, uh, removing the watermark should destroy the image in the sense that, you know, maybe I can do enough processing to the image that uh, I get rid of the watermark, but at that point the image is so crappy that no one would want to look at it anymore. Right? So this is the kind of tension that we're trying to do. And so let me just um, show you a couple of pictures for a second here. I exit, I say. I, I should have uh, queued these up earlier, I'm sorry. So so watermarking gets its name from you know, watermarks on paper, right? So if you have really fancy stationery and you hold it up to the light, you see there is this, you know, extra image that comes from something that says, you know, this is high quality paper, right? So like all the RPI stationery, if you hold it up to the light, you see the RPI seal hovering inside the paper, right? If you hold up your diploma, probably, you'll see some sort of watermark, right? This tells you that the paper is high quality, right? Um, and this is also true in currency. So if you hold up a really, I, I don't think this is in the low denomination bills, but in 50s and $100 bills, you can see there's this ghostly watermark, right? So um, here's kind of a meta image, right? This is a image of a watermark, but it's also attempted to be watermarked by a content provider. So here's an example where the uh, stock image photographer is saying, okay, I'll let you buy this image, and if you buy it, I'll undo this kind of um, corruption that I've added to it, right? So here the idea is that I've got these little spirals I've got a little bit of a text here. It says dreams time. I've got these little lines. You can kind of see it better in this image, right? So the idea is that here, the content provider is trying to, you know, change the image in such a way that they, you know, that you can't undo the corruption without also screwing up the original image, right? It would be hard to hallucinate what's happening underneath these spirals and lines and text, for example. And actually, we'll talk a little bit about how you could do that undoing process next week, that would be kind of like an in-painting problem in some sense. Um, but this is not really what really, really we call watermarking because we've added perceptual information to the image, right? So the image looks different than it did before. And I guess while I'm showing you pictures, so definitely this is now, you know, a different kind of, you know, content manager watermarking is when you watch TV shows, right? So you'll see that there's this little bug, they call it, in the corner where, you know, uh, that's always on while you're watching TV. Back in my day when I was watching TV, they didn't have that little thing in the corner. But as soon as people started to be able to rip TV shows off, you know, the, the broadcast stream, they started to add these things to make sure that, number one, people knew who it was. And the attempt was to try to ensure that you couldn't undo the watermark, right? So, for example, here, the idea is that the watermark is semi-transparent. And so you may not be able to just kind of remove it without removing original pixels of the image. Now, it is true that if you see enough, you know, ABC TV shows, eventually you could figure out what the ABC watermark is supposed to look like, and then you can undo the watermark. And so I think that probably this is not so robust anymore. But it, it definitely, I think it's still the case that if you watch a TV show, usually the watermark will fade out before the commercial starts, right? So basically, the idea is that if you want to at least try to have some minimal security, you don't want to show the watermark on an entirely black background, because that tells you exactly what it is, right? So the idea is that it fades out before it goes to black, so you don't ever have the watermark in the clear, right? Although I think that this could probably be pretty easily defeated these days. Another example, it's not quite watermarking, but while we're talking about it, um, this is what's called the Urion Constellation. And so this is a special array of five, you know, dots that appears on lots of currency, right? So if you look at a bill, you'll see that there are lots of places where you see this arrangement of five objects in this kind of cross shape, right? And this is something that is used to prevent you from making, for example, high quality color photocopies of currency, right? So if you try to make a scan or a high quality Xerox of a dollar bill or a $20 bill or a $100 bill, you're probably going to find that the, the printer will give you a black area. Or if you try to import that image into Photoshop, it may tell you this is an image of currency 
and I'm not going to open it, right? So um, I would try this myself because I'm afraid of getting arrested, but it is, it is possible to do it. Certainly back when, again, when college campuses had, you know, when, when the color printers first came out for student use, obviously the first thing a lot of people thought of was, hey, let's copy some money and see if we can pass it off at the convenience store, right? So now there are lots of built-in things that prevent you from doing that. Uh, another tricky thing is that um, high-end color printers have these patterns of little yellow dots that, uh, you know, people originally were wondering, what are these dots, right? It turns out that these dots encode the printer model uh, and serial number of the printer that printed the document, right? So not all color printers have this, but many high-end printers do. And so basically this is like a secret code that you wouldn't notice if you were looking at the paper from arm's length, but if you zoomed in on it with a microscope, you could tell. So this is something that the you know, law enforcement agencies like to try to use to track down who is uh, printing bad things, right? So uh, I looked at a color printout that I had. I didn't see the yellow dots, but you should take a look at color printouts that you have and see if you find them. Um, so things like uh, movies and Oscar screeners, you know, sometimes I don't see it as much anymore, but definitely um, used to be that you were in a movie and you would see this momentary weird flash of dots on the screen, right? And this is, again, a security measure to prevent people from, you know, uh, recording images in movies. I guess it doesn't prevent them from recording it, but it does help them track down, you know, where the movie was recorded. So the idea is that you might mark different prints of movies with different arrangements of dots so that you could track down what movie theater did this cam screener come out from. Um, and now there are technologies, you know, so here Philips is pushing this thing called Cinefence. You can see it's talking about watermarking and saying that, you know, there's a payload of how many bits you can embed in how many minutes of video. It's to prevent these kind of, you know, spiky-haired punks from recording uh, videos and movies. So, um, so anyway, so this is a definitely of interest to the real world. Um, and what else do I want to show? I guess this is a thing, a TechCrunch or a Ars Technica article from not too long ago, basically saying that you know there's this constant tension between people who are trying to protect the media and trying trying to crack it, right? So for example, um, here there's a there's a story. I don't know if you guys remember that one of the Wolverine movies was leaked to torrent sites before it came out, and it turns out that that leak, even though they kind of lost control of the movie was watermarked, right? So it says, nabbed by a watermark, a New York man subsequently pled guilty to making the movie available, right? So that, that you know, work print was watermarked in such a way that they were able to catch the guy and track down who it, who it went to. And so now, you know, um, people are bragging, right? So here's a guy saying, you know, this is, I think, from one of the Hobbit movies. Movie had watermarks visible and invisible, had to remove frames to get rid of them, blah, 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 right? So now people are, again, trying to figure out where the watermarks are and, and get rid of them, right? So, um, so it's an interesting tension between people who want to add the, you know, people who want to tag the content and people who want to steal the content. So let's talk a little bit about how that, you know, process actually works. So again, I'm going to focus here on watermarking that is done in such a way that you don't tell that it's there, right? So this is, you know, unlike many of the images that I showed where you've got these dots that you see if you zoom in on the image or even if you look at the image with the naked eye, we want to figure out how can we put information into an image in such a way that you can't tell that it's there and that it's very robust. Okay, so here's the idea. So I basically have kind of an insertion or an embedding process where I have an original image. And then I insert the mark. I mean, this is like the dumbest block diagram ever, but I guess I'm drawing it now. So basically, the idea is I insert the mark, which I'm going to call W. And then I have kind of a marked image, I hat, or let's call it I sub W. And then if I am the, you know, content provider and I want to say, okay, so you stole my image, right? So what do I need to do to be able to detect the mark? Well, I take a, you know, input image, which may be any image, right? And I try to extract the mark. So in order to do this, I kind of need to know the process of how did I put the mark in to be able to know how do I get the mark out. And in order to extract the mark, I may need some, ex some extra information. So for example, I may need 
to have the original image, I, in order to understand how to get the mark out. We're going to talk about that in some more concrete detail in just a minute. Right, but the idea is that you know I may need to have some additional side information to know, okay, well, if this is your copy of The Hobbit, I need to have my copy of The Hobbit that is a clean digital copy to be able to understand whether there's something there. Then I have kind of like a candidate, you know, watermark. And then I have a, you know, basically a mark comparison algorithm. Where now I have to say, okay, if I have my original watermark, I may need to say, how do I compare my mark to yours? And then at the end of the day, I hope to produce kind of like a binary decision that says, was my original mark W present in this image or not? Right? And so obviously, it's preferable not to really need this side information, but you can make much stronger watermarking algorithms if you do have it. Right? And so some applications for this, right? So I, I guess we talked about them already. So certainly one is kind of like authentication. You know, is this my copyrighted material? So for example, I put an image on Flickr or I put an image on my Facebook page. Before I do that, I want to watermark the images to make sure that no one can pass off their image as my own and start selling posters with that image on it, right? Um, there are also, you know, a little bit more, um, just I would call it like usage tracking. So for example, uh, when Amazon or when Apple sells you a DRM-free DRM uh, track, right? So while on the one hand it may be true that there is no digital rights management that will prevent that track from being played anywhere else, it's probably also true that there is something embedded imperceptibly in the track that says, I sold this to so-and-so on this day, right? Meaning that if that track shows up on the torrents, they know where it came from and then they can go after you for it, right? So it's not like it's locked down from being played, but there is information inside of it that kind of keeps track of the chain of command, right? So you can imagine that, you know, every time a track gets copied from one computer to the other, maybe we additionally embed some additional metadata to be able to follow the trail into the thing. And so the idea is that we don't want to do that like um, a metadata header that can be stripped off and, and edited. We want to have it be something that's inherently inside the track that you can't get it out without changing the bits of the original music track, right? Um, also, just things like generally like automatically monitoring content usage, right? So maybe you know you don't care about preventing people from using your your image or your video, but you want to know how did this get passed around. So every time it gets passed around to someone else, maybe you want to embed a little mark in it to say, okay, who saw this video when, so I can tell how often it's being accessed. Okay, so what are some desirable properties? I guess I kind of talked about some of this already, but desirable properties of a watermark. So it definitely should be visually imperceptible. So many of the you know, things I showed you in the, in the little figures already fail that test, right? I can tell that something was changed, right? But this is the desirable thing, is that you should be able to say that anything has changed. Also, it should be what I would call statistically imperceptible. And that means that you know the underlying you know statistics of the of the digital object haven't changed either, right? So I'm not changing, for example, the mean and the variance of the pixels by adding the watermark, right? So there should be no way that I could do some sort of a forensic analysis just on the bits to be able to tell that something has changed. So it should definitely be robust to either um, inadvertent or intentional attacks, right? So the kinds of things that may happen to an image, right? So we know there are lots of um, things that I might do to an image just in the course of normal processing, right? I might do cropping, resizing, compression, you know, enhancement, like edge enhancement or histogram equalization, um, rotation, sure. Um, even more complicated, you know, maybe I want to do something like, if I was if I was really trying to defeat the mark, what I might try to do would be maybe I might print the image on a high quality printer and rescan it, 
Um, or maybe something like um, collusion, by which I mean, you know, maybe all of us buy the same track from Amazon, then we average all those tracks, and now we put that track on the torrents, right? So the idea is that maybe by averaging a whole bunch of marked copies, we dilute each individual mark so that, you know, no, so it doesn't look like anything is marked when I send it out, right? So the idea is that maybe I would care to, you know, pay 100 people to download the track if I had them collude to produce something that looked more like the clean copy than any single copy would, right? So this is more intentional, and this is more kind of um, inadvertent. Or, you know, kind of an alternative to robust is fragile. Which is probably not used as much. But the idea is something like, you know, the watermark breaks. as soon as the image is modified. So there's a case where, for example, you know, say I had some sort of like forensic evidence situation where I didn't want, you know, where it's critical that the image that I collected the crime scene has to be the very same one that I presented evidence, right? So that I don't want there to be any way to change the image without breaking the watermark. So I can say, hey, you know, this image has been tampered with, right? So that's not really quite the same problem we're talking about today, but that's kind of an alternative way that you can think about watermark. Um, so, an issue with watermarking is, you know, the capacity, right? So I should be able to embed a useful amount of bits of information, right? So, for example, if I want to take a picture with my, you know, put it in my Flickr account, I want to be able to embed stuff like my name and where it was taken and, you know, contact information and stuff like that. If I can only embed, like, one bit of information for a megabyte image, then it's not a very useful mark. Right. So noise is also going to be one of our attacks, right? So if I want to take some Gaussian noise and add it up, or that comes, you know, either I'm trying to get rid of it by adding a little bit of noise, or I just have a noisy channel, that's also definitely an attack we'll talk about. Yeah. And then, you know, the last thing I guess is speed. So I don't want to have to take um, forever to embed or detect the watermark, right? So, for example, you know, if I have a next generation, you know, Blu-ray, you know, digital media player, I can't take a minute for the player to figure out whether this is an authenticated disc or not. It has to be done immediately so that I can start giving the consumer the experience if they're not, you know, trying to put one over on me. Okay. Okay. So we can't always achieve all these goals, but we try to do pretty well on them. Okay. All right. So let me pause and ask, so comments or questions? Okay. So Kind of, uh, let me go through some increasingly more sophisticated ideas for watermarking, okay? So kind of the dumbest one, which fails some of our tests, is what I would call the spatial watermark. And that is what I showed you with like the little, the little bug. So this is my original image. And then this is my um, kind of watermark image. So something like this where I have, um, you know, so if I'm watching CBS, I, I may have this like CBS logo. And so the idea is that my output image is going to be something like uh, 1 minus alpha times my original image plus alpha times my watermark image. And that's going to be my output, right? So if I have, a, if I have an object that overlaps with the watermark, then when I kind of fractionally combine these things together, the idea is that the watermark is going to overlap with this object, and it will be difficult to undo that addition, right? So it is a, some sort of semi-transparent thing. So there are a bunch of problems with this, right? So for one thing, um, it's quite visible, right? So this is not an invisible watermark by any means. Um, I could you know, crop this watermark out, although these days it seems like they're trying to push that watermark a little bit further into the image than it used to be, right? So if it was, if it was right at the corner, then I could just kind of like remove it entirely. Now it seems like those watermarks are kind of being pushed a little bit further into the frame than they used to be, so that if you were to cut it out, you'd lose, you know, a substantial amount of the frame. Um, and also, like I said before, this is pretty beatable if you ever see 
this watermark image by itself. Right? If you knew this, then you've recovered W, and in theory, you could probably undo the marking process. Right? So this is not so great. Um, so here's a better idea, or possibly a better idea. So one thing I could do is I could mark the least significant bits of an image. Right? So let's suppose that my W is a two-bit image, and my I is an eight-bit image. Right? So this is like a normal grayscale image. This is like an image that only has four levels. Right? And so what I could do is I could make my watermarked image be, you know, I take my original image, I divide it by four, and I take the floor of that, and then I multiply it by four. So now basically this image has all zeros as its least two significant bits. And then I add to that my watermark image. I guess if this is, you know, depending on how I do this, um, you know, if this is a two-bit image in the range of, you know, 0, 64, 128, 192, right? So the idea is that what I do is I replace those small, you know, values with the watermark bits. And so I basically have six bits, a six-bit approximation of the original image plus two least significant bits of watermark. And so this means that at, at worst, every pixel of the image will be changed by, you know, up to three gray levels, which is probably not going to be very perceptible, right? So that may be a way to kind of, you know, if you were doing a quick and dirty way to hide some information, that might not be so bad. Um, on the other hand, it's extremely easy to remove, right? All I have to do is take my image and set all the least, least significant bits to zero. I remove the watermark, and the image should still pr look pretty much the same, right? So um, basically, you know, easy to remove. And it's definitely not robust at all to things like noise or compression or anything like that, right? So this is not a great situation. OK. So let's be a little bit more sophisticated, right? So one thing is that you know maybe instead of doing something where I am you know uh, fooling around with the least significant bits, why don't I keep this idea of adding some sort of noise to the image? The third idea is maybe something like pseudo random noise. So the idea is that to encode a watermark, what I do is I, you know, I split the image into blocks. And then I have, uh, let's say, two random noise patterns. Let's call them W0 and W1 that are the same size as each of the blocks. And then to encode um, a K, you know, to encode a zero or a one somewhere in the image, what I do is I say that my block K is equal to the original block K plus alpha times the watermarking image, either 0 or 1, right? So that's like saying, if I want to encode a 0 in some block, I add a little bit of this noisy image W0. If I add a 1, I add a little bit of this noisy image W1, right? So what I'm doing is I'm choosing certain blocks of the image, and I'm encoding zeros or 1s you know, for each block, depending on which little noisy pattern I've added, right? I don't have to necessarily add block add noise to every block. I could I could choose certain blocks in the image that I know of preferentially encode some bits. And then to decode, what I can do is again, I do the same image block split I did before. And then to figure out whether there's a bit in a block, I correlate each block with W0 and W1 and extract bit K um, corresponding to a higher correlation. Right? 
right? So the idea is that you know, if I have an unmarked image, if I correlate the image with W0 or W1, you know, I'm going to get you know, kind of a random, you know, could be yes, could be no, right? But if I have a marked image where I've definitely added some of this noise into each of these blocks, there should be much higher correlation with the, with the matrix that I actually added versus the one that I did, right? So the idea is that um, you know, a marked image should show high correlation even after I've attacked it a little bit, whereas an unmarked image should basically just kind of give me back a random watermark that doesn't tell me anything, right? So this is definitely a better idea, but it's still going to be sensitive to things like cropping and scaling. Because if I crop the image, suddenly my blocks don't line up anymore, right? And I've lost this, you know, extraction of which block corresponds to the end. I've lost the correct edges of each of the blocks. And certainly if I scale the image to be like 1.03 bigger than it was before in the same way, I've probably screwed that up too. So um, this is not the most robust thing either. Most of the most effective watermarking algorithms aren't things like adding noise in the, in the spatial domain. They correspond to frequency domain attacks, right? So the idea here is that we're going to use some of our ideas that are related to image compression, right? So in image compression, the idea was we want to, you know, throw away or slightly change coefficients that are perceptually insignificant in things like the discrete cosine transform, right? So the idea here is what if we use those same perceptually significant or insignificant parts of the cosine transform to embed our data? So, so most effective algorithms are in the frequency domain. Because in some sense, we learned that that's where we can make some judgments about perceptual significance is by looking at, for example, remember that we had that normalization matrix from the uh, JPEG compression, right? That was derived by looking at how sensitive people are to different you know, values of the cosine transform, right? So basically, uh, what if we were to hide some information in those perceptually insignificant or significant values? And so, in some sense, it's kind of paradoxical, right? So the idea is to hide information in visually important frequency bands. Again, this seems kind of counterintuitive, right? Because in some sense, you would say, well, why don't I want to encode the information in places where people are not going to notice it? Well, that's true. Then you're going to be immediately fragile to attacks that involve things like image compression, where you're getting rid of stuff that people don't care about, right? The idea here is, what if we were to embed the information in places that are perceptually important, so that it's very difficult to get rid of without changing the perceptual uh, nature of the image, right? So it seems a little bit strange, but here's the kind of the idea. So here's a very simple idea based on uh, the DCT. So let's say you know a simple uh, frequency domain, let's say like frequency flipping method. So first I'm going to choose, uh, you know, this is again going to be block based. So let's say we choose like 8 by 8 blocks, for example. So let's choose two DCT coefficients that, or co let's say coefficient locations that are expected to have about the same magnitude. To have comparable average values or ranges. Right? And we can get that from, for example, the DCT normalization matrix that we talked about in the compression lecture. So, for example, it turns out that in that normalization matrix, the <coughs> 4, 1 value and the 2 comma 3 value both had this normalization value of 14, right? Which meant that whenever I do JPEG compression, I'm dividing 
this location and this location in the frequency domain by 14 and quantizing, right? So the fact that I've got the same number kind of tells me that perceptually those values should basically be about as important as each other. And so then what I could do as a simple idea would be for every 8 by 8 block, I compute my DCT, which I'm going to call C of UV. And then if the 4, 1 location is greater than the 2, 3 location, I'm going to say that that's a 0 bit. And if it's less than or equal to, I'm going to say that's a 1 bit. And if the coefficients don't match up with what I want to embed, then I flip them around. So if um, the coefficients don't already um, match my w, then I flip them. Or what I could do is I could say, OK, maybe to make this a little more robust, I could say that I want the difference between this and this to be at least some threshold value to encode the zero bit, to make it a little bit more robust to things that are happening right around the equality line. right? And so this is something where, again, you would be surprised at how well this works if I just were to flip DCT values and then take the inverse DCT to make my watermarked image. Right? The image won't look that different, but there will be this kind of inherent you know, one zero coding in every eight by eight block. Right? And so that lets me encode basically a watermark payload that has the number of bits that is the same size as the image, you know, same number of pixels of the image divided by 64, right? So you can try this at home and see how well it works. I'm not going to show you the results of this. I'm going to show you the results of, of one more even sophisticated algorithm. Then we'll actually see how well it works in MATLAB. But this is actually, you know, uh, not too bad. Again, this can also be kind of easily defeated, though, if I'm an attacker who knows the system, right? And so this is one of these cryptographic principles that we should also obey when we're doing watermarking, right? So the idea is that if the attacker knows the method by which the image was watermarked or encrypted, then they may have the opportunity to be able to undo it, right? So here's a case where if the attacker knows this bit flipping method, well, then all they have to do to undo the watermark is to go back into the image and just randomly flip these two bits until I don't see any, you know, until uh, you know, if I try to attract the watermark, I just get something that didn't correlate at all with my original, right? So this is not very robust to an attacker who knows what's going on. And so the final thing I want to talk about is a approach that actually works pretty well. So this is the one I'm going to show you how it works in MATLAB. So here's a, um, you know, a more robust approach. And this was proposed by a paper in Cox and I'll, I'll put the paper on Piazza. So here's the idea, is that to encode the watermark, first I compute the DCT of the entire image, not just by blocks. Okay. Then I find the K largest coefficients. Let's call them, um, I guess, largest magnitude coefficients. Let's call them C1 through CK. And I'm going to not include the DC coefficient in this, because otherwise that's going to be biggest by far. And then my watermark is going to be K bits long. Uh, it's going to be a K length Actually, in this case, the watermark is not going to be bits. It's going to be a pseudo-random sequence. So the watermark is going to be a k-length random vector where each of these omega or each of these w's is a normally distributed random variable. Right? This is a continuous number drawn from a normal distribution. And then to embed the watermark, So one option is to take my original coefficient and multiply it by this scaling factor, right? So here, alpha is kind of like, um, this is kind of like the strength 
of the watermark. Right? So if alpha is 0, then I'm not changing my coefficients at all. If alpha is, say, 0 0.01, that means that I'm kind of taking my original coefficients and I'm adding, you know, I'm, I'm adding this factor that's related to this random number, wi. Right? So I'm going to change the DCT coefficients just a little bit. And then I basically replace um, ci with ci prime and take the inverse DCT. And so here, this has got some advantages in the sense that you know I'm embedding the watermark in the most perceptually significant frequencies of the image. Right? Um, if I try to remove that watermark, I'm screwing with the most perceptual frequencies, and I may damage the image. Um, and the watermark is like basically a random noise thing; it has no obvious structure to it. And then to decode the image, decoding is kind of like trying to undo this. So decoding. So again, I um, compute the DCT of the image that I've got, you know, uh, and then I extract the k coefficients in the known locations, right? So kind of what I mean here is that in order to undo this, I need to know where did I put the mark in. And it could be that after I've processed or corrupted or attacked the watermarked image, that maybe the top k coefficients are not exactly the same as they were in the original image. So part of this is I have to have the side knowledge of where did I put the mark in in the first place. So I call this kind of like side information. Now I get some coefficients out of my image. Then I can basically compute estimates of where the watermark was simply by undoing this equation and solving for w, right? So what I do is I would divide by c and so on. So my, my So here again, I'm using side information of knowing how strong the mark was, and also I'm using side information of knowing what my original coefficients were. So here, you know, again, I'm not just, you know, I have to have a bunch of stuff that came from my original image to be able to undo this process. And then what I could do is I could compute uh, something very simple, right? Like I could say, for example, I could take my vector w take the dot product with my original watermark, and then divide that through. Sometimes we call this the similarity between w and w hat. It turns out that this number is a normally distributed random variable. You know, this can be shown to be normally distributed under some assumptions. And for example, if this number is greater than 6, that means that um, you know, the normal random variable is greater than 6 deviations from the mean. So in some sense, this number is telling me kind of like how likely is it that these two things are the same, you know, the same vector, right? And so if this number is large, it means that basically it's very unlikely that these two things are not the same random vector, okay? So basically a kind of threshold on this value. I mean, I could also do things like use the correlation coefficient between the two vectors, for example, that would be also fine, right? And then I basically just, um, you know, five is the threshold, th threshold to make decision. So let me just show you an example of, of how this embedding and detection process works. So I code up this particular um, method in MATLAB. So 
let me take this plane image. Okay. Turn off my warnings. Okay, so this is the image I'm going to try to watermark. Okay, so it's got you know um, some low frequency stuff in the area like where the wall is. It's got high frequency stuff in terms of the letters and so on. So I wrote a watermark embedding function. So what this says is I take the original image and I specify how many cosine coefficients I'm going to flip or fool around with and the strength of the watermark. And this is exactly what I told you. I'm going to take the DCT, I'm going to find the biggest values, I make my watermark, I change those values a little bit, I put them back into the uh, DCT, and I take the inverse, right? So this is very simple. And then to detect the image, oops, not this, sorry. To detect the mark, I basically take the same coefficients. So here I need to supply the detection algorithm with a bunch of extra information, right? The original coefficients, the watermark itself, and the strength, and the locations, which is this I and D of where I put the watermark, right? So I extract the coefficients of those locations. I try and find my watermarks. Here, this originally, if I was going to use the cross correlation, here is I just use the similarity measure. And gamma is what I'm going to say is my threshold. So let's see how well this works. So Suppose, for example, I say I'm going to take um, my watermarked image is going to be um, embed in my image. Um, let's say that I use a thousand coefficients and I use a strength of 0.1, 0 0.1. Okay. So the embedding process is fast, and if I look at my watermarked image side by side. You know, I mean, these are already kind of downsampled, so it's kind of hard for you to see on the screen because of the subsampling. But here, you know, they look pretty much the same. I mean, I don't think that you could really pick out any obvious differences. And we could actually, um, you know, compute, for example, uh, the difference, right? So the difference is the original image minus the watermarked image. And if I looked at the maximum or the average difference between those values, no, why you suck? I don't know why I said average instead of mean. It's probably why it didn't work actually. Right. So on the average, I'm changing the pixels by not more than two gray levels, right? Which is pretty minimal, and the biggest change is 26 gray levels, right? So I'm not changing this image a lot. And if I were to look at the, um, if, I were, if I were to look at where those differences were, so this is kind of like the general areas where the watermark's being embedded, right? So some areas are getting brighter, some areas are getting darker, but it's kind of like this cloudy stuff that's spread across the whole image, right? So there's no single spatial location where the image is getting changed. And this is also scaled to be from you know, 0 to 55, if I were to scale this on the same order as the image, I probably would just see a black image. I mean, here you can see there are a couple of white light patches that say that there are some areas where I've made a little bit of a change, right? And actually, uh, since D is uh, positive and negative, I really should do like this, right? So I guess that. Either way, I'm not changing the pixels by that much. OK. And so if I were to detect, well, I guess I should have um, actually paid attention here. So I need to supply myself with all the output arguments, too. So I need to know, after I do this, the indices where I put them in, the coefficients, and the w. So I'm just going to actually copy this over. So here I see that my watermark is this thousand by one 
normal vector. I've got a thousand indices where I embedded things, and I've got the original thousand coefficients. And then if I were to detect my watermark, I would test it with this image and these indices and all this stuff. And I guess alpha I have to supply also. So here, this detection comes back with some really big number, right? So remember, this is like, the way I think of it, this is kind of like the number of standard deviations away from a zero mean random variable, right? So this is saying, like, you know, the watermark is definitely strongly present in this image. Maybe I would normally threshold this image at, maybe I would threshold this number at, like, say, five or six, where if it's above five or six, I think it's present, otherwise I think it's absent, right? So here, the watermark is really present, and of course it is because I haven't actually done anything to the image, right? So. Hopefully, it's certainly strongly present. So then what I did was I wrote a, um, what did I call it? Uh, attack, attack. So then I started to make a list of ways to try to screw up the image, right? Things that I, you know, either are, you know, uh, intentional or unintentional, right? So here, I've got a whole bunch of attacks. Stretching the contrast of the image, histogram equalization, throwing away the lowest, lowest bits, um, making it bigger by a factor of 1.3 and then shrinking it back down to the original size, shrinking it by half and then expanding to the original size, uh, cropping some pixels off the edges and resizing it, adding some Gaussian noise that are low variance, high variance, JPEG compressing it with different qualities, so these are kind of all the kinds of normal image processing operations that we might want to, in the course of normal processing, apply to the image, right? And so um, now what I can do is I can apply all these attacks to my uh, image. So I'm going to apply all this stuff here. And then just to give you a sense of what this looks like, uh, I wrote a little function to show these attacks. I guess I also have to. I guess I gave them names so I could title them. Oops, crap. Right, so here, what we're going to see is, you know, what the images look like after the attack, right? So again, these images are all going to kind of look more or less the same as the original, right? Because these are just kind of like benign operations. So it's contrast stretching, histogram equalization, dropping least significant bits, shrinking and enlarging it. So here, you know, if I were to shrink it down and enlarge it, I should expect to see some kind of loss of quality in general because, you know, it should be a little bit blurrier than it was before, right? Because I've lost information when I shrink it, and then I kind of have to interpolate when I make it bigger, right? So. This is going to be kind of a blurrier version. So one way to think about this is kind of like a low-pass filter. Um, adding a little bit of noise. So here the, the image is definitely crappier than it was before. Adding a lot of noise. So here the image is definitely almost unusable, right? Uh, a little bit of compression, a little bit more compression. So again, when I do high compression, you start to see, like, uh, you'll see the blocks if I were to zoom in on these uh, wall tiles, for example. And so now let's see what is the report about how well I did. So I wrote a function to kind of report how well things worked here. So again, what I'm going to do is run my uh, watermarking image or watermarking algorithm here. And then I'm going to make a little list of how well my watermark survived, right? Well, no, what happened? Okay. So what this is saying is that on the average, oh, I see. So on the average, I hardly changed the pixels of the image at all, actually. And the biggest difference I made was 60. Not too bad. And then these numbers tell me what is my, you know, detection score after I do each of these things, right? So here, you know, I can see that all these uh, scores are still quite high, right? Which means that I didn't really damage my watermark at all. So for example, you know, dropping the least significant bits, hardly did anything. Compressing the image, again, hardly did anything. And part of the reason for that is that compression, for example, is going to throw away low-valued DCT coefficients, whereas I'm putting all my stuff into high-value coefficients. So that's going to have very little effect. 
you know, in the presence of low noise, it's still there. Even after you saw that really crappy image, the score is still pretty high. Um, the worst case scenario, it seems like, is, um, for example, when I threw out some pixels along the edges and resized it, that seemed like it threw things off a little bit. And histogram equalization also seemed like it threw it off a little bit. And then this other here, this collusion, is basically what I mentioned earlier, where what I did was I took um, 10 different independent watermarks, and then I averaged the image. And then I said, OK, how strong is my first watermark? Right. So this is like saying I've diluted the watermark by a factor of 10. And so the dilution actually didn't seem like, you know, again, I definitely diluted the mark, but it's still there pretty strongly. And so I, you know, you can fool around with what would happen if I were to, um, you know, make the mark stronger or put it in different numbers of coefficients. Right. So if I were to, for example, make the mark a little bit stronger, then you can see that the mark survives, you know, a little bit better. Although actually, collusion still seems like it uh, had a problem. But if I were to look at my, um, I guess I should actually get my output. Since every time I run this, I'm getting a different random watermark, the results are going to differ a little bit run to run. So here I can see that, you know, making the watermark stronger is changing the, you know, maximum difference I add to the images. And if I start to look at my um, output images, I may start to see the watermark. So again, it's the kind of thing where if you looked at this, you know, by itself, you might not necessarily notice anything was wrong. But if I were to um, put these images side by side, so let's see, I don't know if I still have the original one here. Right, so the left hand is the watermarked image, the right hand is the original image. You can definitely see that here there are like these weird black clouds that are intruding on the original image, and that's where the watermark bits are, you know, where the watermark is being changed. Right? So instead of this looking like kind of a, a nice clean, you know, light surface, there's kind of like this mottled texture that is coming from, you know, things being changed. Same over here, apparently. Right, so the stronger the, wa the, stronger the mark is, the more visually perceptible it is. Whereas if I were to um, make the mark a little bit less strong, here again I'm only changing the uh, the image by like you know up to nine pixels, and the the you know the results are still pretty strong for many of the attacks. And if I were to look at my you know my watermarked image. I should see that those images are pretty hard to tell apart, right? Um, and so, again, this is the kind of thing, it's not too hard to program up yourself and fool around with it. Um, and definitely this is, like I said, exactly what the, you know, uh, movie studios and uh, recording industry want to be able to do to make sure that when they distribute digital media, there's some way for them to keep track of it, right? Um, so certainly whenever you see a case involving you know, Oscar screeners being torrented and they're trying to track down who did it. Watermark, watermarking technology is underneath that whole thing, right? So we didn't talk at all about um, video, right? So video would be a whole other can of worms about how do you embed watermarks. And here's an idea. So to give you a sense of what the industry would tolerate, right? So if you go back now to look at the um, service here that's being promoted. so. This here is saying payload size is 35 bits every five minutes, right? So here, clearly, you know, I'm embedding much less information than I was in the, even just the single image, right? So here, the idea is that they're willing to tolerate a relatively small watermark size as long as it is super robust, right? So you have to think about what is going to be done to videos after the guy takes the image in the theater, right? So it has to be robust to like handheld shaky cam recording, right? Uh, it has to be robust to super compression, right? Because the thing that you want to do when you torrent the uh, when you torrent the video is used to be that you want to torrent it down to 700 megabytes, right? Which is the size that you could put on a CD or something like that, right? Wasn't that the magic number? There was some number that you know all the torrent files were like the same size when it looked at the video, right? So they know what the pirates are trying to do, and they're trying to make sure that their system is going to be robust to uh, that kind of, you know, 
quality loss, right? And they're willing to tolerate a pretty you know, low payload to be able to do that, right? Um, and here again, so for audio, they're saying the watermark will survive, for example, over the air microphone capture, right? So instead of having a digital connection between your DVD player and your, you know, stealing guy, you've got a guy who's got a camcorder who's got all the ambient noise from the movie theater. You need to be able to still detect the audio watermark there, right? But again, the payload is extremely low. So it's not hard to imagine you basically it's fairly robust to that. Um, and just kind of as a little, a little side note, so when I was in grad school, um, I had some, some friends of mine in the PhD program who did this thing called the uh, SDMI challenge. So basically, um, back in the late 90s, the recording industry kind of, uh, I don't want to say too much, I don't want to get sued, but basically the idea was that they said, okay, we think we've got these watermarking techniques that are going to survive anything, right? So we're going to challenge the world of hackers to break our watermark, right? So they put out, uh, so they gave, I think, uh, some original and watermarked tracks, and then they gave tracks that were only watermarked and challenged hackers to remove the watermark so that their oracle would think that it was the original track, right? So that basically the watermark had been removed. And so uh, a group of my grad student friends and some faculty decided to take on the challenge, and they removed all the watermarks. And then the recording industry sued them because they weren't expecting that to happen, right? And so then it was actually pretty awkward because one of my, you know, one of my colleagues, her PhD thesis was kind of held up in legal limbo because she was worried about whether she could publish it or not. So eventually, you know, they, the, eventually the, the students prevailed uh, and they published their results about how they broke the watermarks. And so it kind of made the recording industry think twice about how uh, cocky they could be about how well their algorithms worked, right? So, uh, so it's an interesting thing. It's like this cat and mouse thing. Okay, so any questions about um, watermarking? And things like that. Yes? So removing it is difficult, but is it easier to alter it? So instead of them thinking that you right. went to a store in Connecticut, right. that you went to a store somewhere else? Oh, yeah. I don't think, it, I mean, put it this way I think if you can extract the watermark, then, uh, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to change the watermark. I, I think that I would say. That. In some sense, that's kind of what you're doing by trying to do the collusion attack, right? So the idea would be, you know, say I had 10 friends and we went to 10 different stores and then we tried to average our watermarks together. In this case, in this algorithm, the locations where those bits are going to be embedded is always going to be the same because I've got the same original source, right? So in theory, that's kind of like the equivalent of trying to change the bits or change the numbers of the watermark, right? But this collusion attack shows that I can still find each of the component watermarks even after the collusion, right? So maybe I might need to get a thousand people to buy things at different stores to sufficiently dilute the mark. Well, what about like if, uh, if I decide to add my own watermark and it tampers with Oh, the right. Original? So that's kind of a different kind of attack. But yes, you could also do that where you can either try to overwrite the watermark in some sense. Um, but it turns out that once you've added this random noise or this random uh, perceptually significant stuff, it's very hard to un do it, right? So it's kind of like you can't erase it. You have to kind of just write over it, but you can still see what was underneath in some sense, right? So it's pretty tricky to do. Now, again, this paper that I just showed you, this, this algorithm is probably from like the late 90s, and so I'm sure that what people are doing now is much more advanced than this, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting kind of field of study if you're interested in, uh, yeah, and, and, as, and it's something that uh, has this interesting interplay between technology and public policy and, you know, copyright and copy fight and all that stuff. So it's kind of fun. Okay, so what I want to do now is, let me stop my uh, lecture here.